Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the workshop. So this morning, we start with the third plenary session. The title is Effective Enforcement, the Need for Swift Intervention in Unilateral Conduct Cases, Procedural Tools, and Existing Challenges for Competition Agencies. Now, please welcome the moderator of this session, Ms. Marisa Centella, Director General for Competition from National Markets and Competition Commission of Spain. Ms. Centella, you have the floor. Now it works. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Marisa Tierno Centella. As I uh, just mentioned, I I am Director General for Competition at the Spanish uh, Markets and Competition Commission, and it is a pleasure to be here with you in this uh, plenary session open, opening the day of the 8th of March, uh, Women's Day, and it is just by chance that uh, we are all women on this uh, panel. It is not by chance that we are all enforcers. Uh, you see three of us, there are two more uh, uh, colleagues uh, that will be online, hopefully, um, so, let me introduce them uh, now. Let's hope that magic works. So, uh, we have Jeanette Lozano, Chief Economist uh, at, at the Superintendent Interin Superintendencia, I will say it in Spanish, it will be easier, of uh, Industry and Commerce in Colombia. Do we have her online? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, we will see you in, uh, ah, now we see you, hi. We have also Marina Iskander, who is Head of Competition Policy and Competitive Neutrality in the department, uh, in, in that department of the Egyptian Competition Authority. Hello. Well, you see. Hi, good morning. Hi. Uh, there is a certain delay, I see. And then uh, on the table, uh, in the far left, uh, we have uh, uh, Sally Hubbard, Senior Counsel of the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And uh, uh, next to me, we have uh, Laurien Lepin, uh, Head of Unit in the Int Investigation Services at the Autorité de la Concurrence uh, in France. So I will also take my turn, apart from moderating, to <laughs> explain to you uh, about the experience of the CNMC in this domain. Okay, as an introduction, uh, we all know that it is fair to say that unilateral conduct is a bit special uh, amongst the topics that we discuss in the ICN. Why is it so? Because it is the field of competition compared to cartels or mergers where the systems are more disparate. They differ more on substantive rules, right? So the diversity of regimes makes it that the term unilateral conduct does not only cover practices uh, having a, a degree of market power as a starting uh, point. You also have other types of conduct as, for instance, unfair competition. Um, but even if we just look into those uh, unilateral conducts that have as a basis a certain degree of market power, whichever it is in the different systems, uh, the, the competition agency that takes issue, like is the case of the European Commission or of the Spanish uh, Competition Authority, takes issue to um, abuses of, uh, of a dominant position. Um, it doesn't, we don't care, let's say, about the dominant position in itself. There is nothing wrong with having a dominant position if you did it on your merits, except if you are acquiring it through a merger. Uh, but uh, instead, uh, we care when there is the reinforcement of the dominant position through means that are not competition on the merits or when, when you have uh, an abuse of a dominant position. Then you have the monopolization system of which uh, maybe Sally will say something that has another paradigm. Or you have still the economic dependence that involves a certain degree of market power but is relative to another party. So that's why the first round of interventions and I would need to have a, a slide on it, the first slide. We have prepared a comparative view for you to follow us better. 
and then there uh, we will make a short round to briefly explain the substantive unilateral conduct rules that each of us is meant to enforce. Um, and then the procedural tools at our disposal to deliver effective and timely enforcement in this field. Then we will go to the main round that will focus on experiences uh, regarding the imposition of remedies or interim measures or resorting to commitments uh, or settlements. So for now, uh, with this comparative table on the screen, I turn to Sally. Uh, could you tell us in five minutes more about what monopolization entails and how the current administration envisages tackling these cases as a matter of priority? Okay. <laughs> Usually my voice is loud enough that I don't need a mic. <laughs> um, I wanted to say thanks for having me. This is my first time to Tokyo, and I'm already completely in love with the city and planning my next trip here. Um, so in the U.S., as you all know, we uh, do not have abuse of dominance. We have monopolization and attempted monopolization thanks to the Sherman Act, which we've had since 1890. Um, the relevant section is Section 2. It allows for both civil and criminal prosecution. Uh, and we recently had our first criminal prosecution in a long time um, in, a, in a case called Zito. Um, it was just a small scale case where uh, a man who, his business was sealing up the cracks in the highways. And, um, you know, when states need to get their highways repaired, they put out contracts, they request for bids um, to get, uh, you know, different companies to compete uh, and bid for those contracts. And what Zito did was he called up the other highway crack ceiling business and said, hey, let's make a strategic partnership and uh, we'll, I'll bid in these states and you bid in those states. Um, now, the competitor that he had contacted was smart enough to not to agree to that um, and to turn him in. And uh, we were actually able to do a criminal prosecution under Section 2 of the Sherman Act um, and got a guilty plea. And Zito could serve up to a year in jail um, and up to a million dollar fine. We're still waiting the sentencing. Um, but re you know, reviving Sherman Act Section 2, um, both civilly and criminally, is a huge uh, priority of this administration. Um, as you all know, we also filed the Google search and Google ad tech cases. Google search was actually filed in the previous administration. Um, and you know, these were the first cases. Google search was the first uh, big monopolization case since US v. Microsoft, which I studied in law school and I've been out for quite a while. Um, so, uh, you know, we're very intent on reviving Sherman Act Section 2. Um, the requirements are to show monopoly power plus exclusionary conduct. Um, we do not have interim measures. Uh, you know, we know these cases take a long time, so we're doing, you know, what we can to speed up our investigations. Um, but we are limited in terms of, you know, making it, having those types of procedural tool, tools to make things go faster. Uh, we do have the ability to move for an injunction, technically, uh, but the legal standard is so high that we rarely do that in a Section 2 conduct context. Um, we do not have leniency uh, for Section 2. It's only available for Sherman Act Section 1. Oh, I remembered, I forgot one thing I wanted to say about the Zito case that was quite interesting, is that Sherman Act Section 1 requires an agreement whereas Sherman Act Section 2 covers both monopolization and attempted monopolization. So we would not have been able to prosecute Zito under Section 1 since the person that he tried to collude with did not agree. Um, but because he attempted to monopolize, we were able to prosecute him under Section 2. Um, so that's a, a tool that uh, Section 2 allows us to get at those attempts. Um, in terms of remedies, you know, courts can order any relief that is just and proper. We can settle uh, our cases with parties. Um, we're not inclined to do that very much under this administration because we've seen the failures, 
of past settlements, we want to get meaningful relief, which normally would require structural, uh, structural relief um, and is not something that's typically agreed to uh, in a settlement <clears throat> uh, situation. Most companies are not going to agree to break themselves up. Um, I think that's the basics for the overview, so I'll wrap up my section right now. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to turn uh, now to Marina. Uh, could you briefly explain to us how the abuse of dominance is conceived and enforced under Egyptian law? Yes, hi everyone, good morning. Um, so uh, very briefly, um, um, unilateral conduct is addressed under Article 8 of the Egyptian Competition Law, which was issued in 2005. And uh, Article 8 prohibits abuse of dominant position. So uh, we've also got Article 4, which, which says that a dominant position um, is where an undertaking has at least 25% market share and it has the ability to control prices and quantities. And uh, accordingly, Article 8 lists a number of, uh, it has an exhaustive list of exploitative and exclusionary abuses that uh, a dominant undertaking cannot carry out. So these include um, the practices that are found up across different laws in different jurisdictions, such as tying and bundling, price, pricing below cost, exclusivity, refusal to supply, etc. Um, and in the last 10 years or so, uh, ECA has, covered, uh, has, has uncovered 23 abuse of dominance cases in different sectors, including digital markets, agriculture, beverages, automotive, uh, covering most of the abuses listed in Article 8. And um, our enforcement tools um, allow us to use interim measures in all cases, including abuse of dominant position cases. And, um, and of course, these are optional. Some cases require that interim measures are issued, mainly if we find that uh, without the interim measures, there would be an irreparable harm on competition. In other cases, we go straight to the infringement decision which uh, can take two routes. There is the criminal route, so the infringement decision could could um, could be so that the board of directors of ECA decides that we refer the matter to the public prosecution, or we could go down the administrative route uh, where we order the infringement undertaking to remove the infringement within a set period of time. But um, if we do carry out that option, we do not have fine setting powers. That is only the power that is like the power of the court only. So under the administrative route, we can also we can only uh, order a cease and desist decision uh, or a settlement decision. Thank you very much. I turn now to Jeanette. In Colombia, you have provisions regarding abuse of uh, dominant position, but also some provisions on excessive pricing, irrespective of dominance, if I am correct. Would you take uh, five minutes to introduce us to that? Thank you very much and good morning Tokyo and good night in, in America. Uh, on behalf of the SIC, it's a great honor to be here and share experience uh, regarding remedies and commitments also in abuse of uh, dominant position cases. So in order to, to make a, a brief description about uh, Colombia's state of play, as uh, you will see in my introduction, uh, in Colombia competition uh, regime, uh, we have uh, as an anti-competitive uh, conduct uh, the abuse of dominant position in a relevant market. So uh, in this way, uh, the Colombian Competition Authority uh, has the possibility of ordering the implementation of different remedies uh, that may consider it uh, useful uh, to improve the market conditions in addition to imposing a monetary sanction. And also the SIC um, has the possibility, for example, of accepting uh, commitments uh, for a dominant uh, agent uh, with certain requirements in order to fight, for example, uh, an investigation without having uh, to impose a sanction. So uh, according to the um, uh, Colombian competition law, we define a dominant position as the possibility uh, to determine directly or indirectly uh, the market condition. So um, the dominant position represents for us such a market power that uh, 
it grants the ability, for example, uh, for an undertaking to determine influencing um, the corresponding economic variables as uh, price, quantities, qualities of a product. Uh, in the article uh, 15, uh, we have uh, this definition uh, for the, this possibility to determine uh, the condition, mar the market condition. Uh, so, in order to determine the existence of or a dominant uh, company, the analysis of different variables is required. As I said, for example, the product and geographic market definition, supply and demand, sustainability assessment, entry barrier, etc. Um, we established in the Article 50 of the Decree uh, 2153 uh, a series of conducts that uh, can be sanctioned. Uh, as abuse of dominance, including, for example, predatory pricing, timing, market allocation, uh, margin squeeze, and other ones. Um, in recent years, the superintendent has analyzed some eventual abuse of dominant position. For example, as you say, in Colombia, but the excessive uh, prices is not considered, for example, an abuse of dominance. So uh, this is a quite a uh, state of play in Colombia for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I turn to Lorian. Can you briefly introduce us to the type of unilateral conduct that is covered in, in France? Thank you, Marisa. I would like to begin by thanking the GFTC for inviting me to share some thoughts about um, SWIFT enforcement in antitrust unilateral conduct cases. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will, as uh, introductory remarks, uh, give a brief overview of first the types of violations we're looking at, uh, second our main procedural options, and third uh, some of our investigative tools um, that we are using to uh, tackle unilateral conduct cases. Starting with um, the violations we're looking at, I will um, um, just say that over the past five years, if we look broadly at all uh, antitrust um, cases, we have around 40% of unilateral conduct cases. The French system is structured to mainly address abuse of dominant position cases under the meaning of 102 and of um, its equivalent in the French commercial code. Um, over the, the last years, uh, the uh, Autorité de la Concurrence has handled abuses of different forms, both exclusionary and exploitative. Um, for instance, tight selling, exclusivity clauses, disparaging, uh, more recently uh, favoring one's own technologies, um, adopting opaque and uh, operating rules and applying them in a random manner, uh, imposing unfair trading conditions, for instance. Uh, that's the first violation. Uh, the French commercial code also prohibits, like certain other jurisdictions, the abuse of the state of economic dependence. Uh, the subject was the t this subject was the theme of a very interesting breakout session yesterday, so I will not go into details. Just a quick reminder um, on the fact that contrary to abuse of dominance, uh, the abuse of the state of economic dependence does not require proof of dominance and rather focuses on the economic relationship between two undertakings and in vertical relations more, more specifically. Although to date case law involving um, abuses of the state of economic dependence is very limited in France, um, it, the notion is still worth mentioning since it was recently used in a, in a case that was also discussed yesterday and that involved Apple. Turning now to the procedural options that we have. Okay, that's fine. Um, the, the French authority uh, benefits from a comprehensive uh, toolbox, which has been recently reinforced by the ECN Plus Directive, and which includes injunctions, settlements, commitments, interim measures, uh, all options that we do use in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work. Um, if I can quickly share a few figures, uh, if we focus on the past five years and on unilateral conduct cases only, uh, the FCA issued uh, 12 decisions imposing fines, um, of which five were settlement cases, and in, in three of those cases, commitments were accepted as part of the settlement. 
Of the 12 sanctioned decisions, uh, three, uh, in three cases, the, the FCA ordered uh, injunctions. We also had four commitment decisions issued in the same five years period, commitments being here uh, considered as uh, independent decisions, uh, independently of a settlement uh, sanction decision, and two interim measures procedure. And finally, a, a word about um, two investigative tools that we use um, and we can be of interest in these discussions. Inspections first are used in uh, unilateral conduct cases. In one third of the cases when we uh, do inspections, it is for unilateral conduct cases. And maybe also a word about obstruction, which is a, an infringement that is useful to, uh, to ensure the effectiveness of the authority's powers of, in of investigations. And we've had five decisions with respect to obstruction in, in the last five, five years. Four were sanctions. I will leave it here for this introduction. Thank you very much. So I will say a word also about uh, the situation in Spain. So uh, the CNMC intervenes uh, uh, against uh, unilateral conduct in the form of abuse of, uh, of a dominant position. I have already mentioned uh, what the regime entails. And it is similar in that sense to France, of course, because we are part of the European Union. So we have our own provision for, for the, in, in, under national law, and we enforce together Article 102 of the treaty with Article 2 when appropriate, or even when Article 2 is enforced on its own. According to the, our Supreme Court, it has to be enforced, taking into account the principles applicable in the enforcement of Article 102. Um, an infringement of uh, any of those articles is a very serious infringement under Spanish uh, law. And the CNMC has uh, dealt with both exclusionary and exploitative abuses. So uh, we had cases of predatory pricing, margin squeeze, loyalty rebates, exclusivity clauses, tying, uh, refusal to deal, and uh, sham litigation. And also of excessive pricing. And then uh, on top of the abuse of dominance, we have another kind of uh, unilateral conduct that is covered by our Article 3 of the, um, of the Competition Act that forbids uh, distortion of free competition by unfair acts which affect the public interests uh, by distortion of uh, competition. Uh, this article has been very used in the past uh, in liberalizing markets. Um, and is now used again uh, by us in, uh, in cases. It includes uh, matters uh, such as bad faith, uh, the fact of misleading others, deceiving, disparaging, that you could take on the one article uh, or the other, exploiting the economic dependence of clients or providers, and a breach of Article 3 is a serious infringement. The other one is a very serious infringement, this one is a serious infringement. But then a breach of commitments, of, of a decision imposing commitments or accepting commitments or imposing remedies and all that is again a very serious uh, infringement. Now on procedural tools, we can impose interim measures, both ex officio and upon request. And this is not because of the directive. We already could that, do that because before of the ECN plus directive. Um, I'm going quickly so that we can pass to the to the next subject. But uh, you know that interim measures are temporary measures uh, that should be appropriate and that uh, can be adopted while you are investigating a practice to uh, prevent uh, um, that uh, by the end of the process when you really get to the decision on the merits, uh, you know you you cannot anymore have an effective uh, enforcement because uh, the circumstances have gone quicker than your procedure. Um, taking into account the speed of our ordinary procedures, because from the moment that we open formally uh, proceedings uh, until there is a final decision by our board, which encompasses, therefore, a statement of objections, a first round of allegations, a proposal of, uh, of decision still by us, by the Directorate for Competition, and then a second round of allegations, and then the decision by the board, it is 18 months. So, let's say our ordinary procedure is already very speedy, uh, but still sometimes we use interim measures. And um, uh, since, 20, since 20, uh, 108, we have assessed 16 interim measure, measure cases, uh, four ex officio and 12 upon request, 
and the council has granted them uh, in 50% of the, of the cases. Um, we don't have settlements yet. Uh, we, we, it is in parliament, so we hope to be able to apply settlements uh, across the, the board uh, for all kinds of infringements, including uh, abuses of dominance and Article 3. Uh, commitment decisions are also foreseen, and they are actually adopted in, uh, in our cases. And uh, then uh, we do not only find companies, we also find individuals, directors. Uh, so the CNMC has imposed fines on 56 uh, in individuals since 2018, and 25 of them uh, were in the last two years. We also have the possibility to impose a public contracting ban, so the, to, to forbid companies from uh, participating in, in public uh, contracts, which is something that uh, can be taken into account by, by companies sometimes more than fines. And uh, then uh, the CNMC normally relies on behavioral remedies. And that concludes the first uh, uh, round. And um, I want to thank everybody for setting the scene for the ensuing uh, debate. So focusing on uh, effective enforcement, we are now going to focus really on these instruments that, uh, that I, we have been mentioning, uh, the procedural tools. And I turn now again to Lorient, so we are going to do it in, in the reverse order. Uh, and uh, I would like to, you to tell us about the importance of using different tools uh, uh, for enforcement to respond to abuses, and in particular, your takeaways from the Google-related case that you had in France. Uh, so how did you manage that? Thank you. Um, in the second part, I will uh, briefly describe the, um, the interim measures tool um, mechanism in, in, the, in French law, and then focus on this uh, recent case concerning um, press publishers and which in, indeed illustrates the way uh, the authority uh, uses its toolbox with you know, varying tools. Quoting the ICN Plus Directive, uh, interim measures can be an important tool to ensure that while an investigation is ongoing, the infringement being investigated does not seriously and irreparably harm competition. This is true in unilateral conduct cases where time is very often of, of the essence. The basic rules in France um, are, are that a request for interim measures is ancillary to a request on the merits of the case and cannot exist independently. It can be requested by a complainant, by the Minister of the Economy, and thanks to the ECN Plus Directive, it can uh, also now be initiated ex officio by the authority. Two conditions must be met. Um, we need to have a behavior that is likely to constitute a, um, an abuse of dominant position here, and that creates an immediate and serious harm to the economy, to the sector, or to the complainants. As you can see, we are not in the minimum uh, that was set by the ECN Plus Directive, which is irreparable harm to competition. Uh, we uh, have more extensive powers in terms of interim measures, and we can intervene if there is an immediate and serious harm to the economy or the sector or the complainants. Um, interim measures must be limited pending the case on the merit, and they must be uh, both necessary and proportionate. Uh, this standard of proof uh, remains challenging, and uh, on average, uh, five out of six uh, requests for interim measures are rejected. Uh, those measures are not restricted to certain sectors. They, in practice, apply to all sectors, and they can consist of clarifying certain rules, uh, giving certain information, uh, amending a contract, uh, suspending a contract. Um, the possibilities are, are wide. Turning now to um, the related rights case, um, this case uh, is the last time the, um, the authority um, ordered interim measures uh, in 2020. Uh, it is a case uh, which started with the entry into force of the law Uh, of the law of 2019 in France, transposing uh, into French law directive on copyright and related rights in the digital single market. This law um, basically aimed to establish um, 
uh, the conditions for balanced negotiations between publishers, news agencies, and uh, online public communication services platforms in order to redefine the sharing of value between them in favor of the press. Um, upon the entry into force of the law, Google unilaterally decided that it would no longer display uh, excerpts from articles, photographs, and videos within its, its various services unless it was granted free licenses to do so. And in practice, that's what publishers did, uh, trying to remain visible uh, in uh, Google search results and trying to avoid suffering significant loss in traffic from Google. Um, still, the case was brought, brought to the uh, authority, and in the five months period, uh, the authority ordered interim measures on the following ground, considering first that Google had a dominant position on the, uh, for, on the market for general search services, and that it was likely to have abused its dominant position in several ways, one of these ways being imposing unfair trading conditions on press publishers and press agencies. This behavior was considered to have caused serious and immediate harm to the press sector, um, relying on um, mainly on debates and reports, uh, parliamentary debates and reports that had emphasized uh, the utmost importance of the law uh, in the context of an emergency uh, that was facing the press sector in France. The set of interim measures that were ordered consisted of imposing on Google to negotiate in good faith with uh, press publishers and news agencies um, in a limited period of three months. And as part of the set of interim measures, there were other safeguards and neutrality obligations. Um, this first step of the case uh, was early, uh, a few months later, confirmed that by the Paris Court of Appeal, and we entered into a second step, which is that the same complainants came to us um, <coughs> alleging that uh, Google had not respected the interim measures decisions, uh, decisions, sorry, after six months, and um, so um, after a thorough investigation in July 2021, the authority issued a new decision, a sanctioned decision this time, ruling that Google indeed had breached um, several interim measures and that it had failed to negotiate in good faith. The authority imposed a fine of 500 million euros, considering this breach as being very serious and ordering Google to comply with the injunctions uh, under penalty. And there we come to the third, and I hope the last step of the case. Um, in, June 2000, uh, in June 2022, sorry, less than a year after the sanctioned decision, uh, the authority um, decided to close the case on the merits uh, by accepting Google's uh, last um, commitments proposal. The framework that the, the authority made binding for Google is more elaborate than uh, the initial set of interim measures in particular with respect to the data that uh, Google now agrees to share with press publishers and press agencies. Um, uh, this is the core issue of the case, um, data with respect to uh, uh, Google's revenues, direct and indirect, in order to set the appropriate remuneration for the protected content. Uh, these commitments are monitored by an independent trustee, and should negotiations fail during this um, three months period, the um, negotiating party can bring the case to an arbitration court, which would then set the appropriate remuneration for the protected content. Those commitments are applicable for a five-year period, then can be, it can be renewed once. And um, this case, in my view, illustrates that in a two-year period, three decisions have been issued by the authority using several tools and you know, aiming to achieve a uh, swift and efficient uh, enforcement. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. So uh, now we are going to speak a bit about the use of settlements and commitments. According to an OECD uh, study, uh, between 2015 and 2020, 21.7% 20, 20, uh, of abuse of dominant cases um, uh, ended up in, in, in that way. And for OECD countries, it reached 40.7% of cases. Uh, so I am going to turn now to Marina. Uh, you have explained that the Egyptian authority can actually issue interim measures 
uh, which you have is used uh, um, recently. But then you have also explained, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you can use administrative decisions or you can act as prosecutors before the court. And in the second case, um, then uh, the parties involved can choose to settle uh, with the authority instead. Would you like to talk more about that and explain how settlements work in Egypt and in which situations do you use them? Yes, um, exactly. So we can, um, uh, so in some cases, ECA can choose to refer the case to the public prosecution. In that case, the public prosecution would raise the case to the court. And in both cases, whether ECA decides to simply issue an administrative decision or refer the case to the prosecution, uh, the parties can have um, the chance to submit a settlement request to ECA. So, um, so what happens in that case is that the parties um, ask ECA if they can settle the infringement uh, for uh, for a, or for a fee that would be much smaller than the fine that they would otherwise pay in court, and um, um, and the fee depends on whether or not the settlement request has been uh, received. Uh, before or after referral has been made to the public prosecution. If it's before, then the maximum that can be applied is less than uh, that would be applied if uh, the referral has already been made. And um, these ranges or the minimum maximum are laid out in the law and how we determine um, the exact fee is according to internal guidelines that are used by ECA. So we kind of start by a maximum number and we apply um, discounts according to the level of cooperation the parties have carried out with ECA um, and other factors such as, for example, um, reimbursing uh, complainants or consumers that were harmed uh, due to the practice. And uh, ECA um, has always encouraged settlements, but it really um, has um, encourage them more in the past uh, few years. Um, in fact, we also accept settlement requests before an infringement decision is ordered. So sometimes a party can realize that its conduct is being investigated by ECA and it can submit a settlement request even before the infringement is ordered against it. And we encourage that because it usually means that the party will cooperate with ECA and save on the resources needed to investigate the infringement. And that is often taken into consideration in determining the final settlement amount. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and then I turn to Jeanette. Uh, I would like you to expand on the Colombian experience with commitments in unilateral conduct cases. And we are also curious about uh, this excessive pricing prohibition. Thank you, Marisa. Um, it's important to note that uh, the commitment proce uh, procedure implemented in Colombia uh, has uh, some special uh, characteristic uh, with respect of other jurisdiction. Uh, for example, in Colombia, in principle, uh, the SIC can analyze and accept uh, commitments in framework of investigation, not only for unilateral conduct, but also for agreements and other coordinate, uh, coordinated anti-competitive conduct. We have a special uh, mention, but it's some different from other uh, jurisdiction. Uh, in recent years, um, the Colombian Competition Authority uh, has established uh, different criteria uh, that is taken into, uh, into account when we are analyzing uh, commitments. So the SIC has said that the commitments in Colombia, for example, cannot aim uh, exclusively uh, at complying with the law. Uh, they must be effective uh, to seize or modify uh, the anti-competitive uh, behaviors and the incentive uh, to exclude, uh, to execute uh, them. Three, uh, they should be preferably to be structural under a market uh, point of view. And four, uh, they must comply with the policy of promotion and protection of competition. So these criteria have been used uh, through the years uh, by the authority. Uh, we have a develop, uh, doctrinal development, um, considering also the type of conduct being investigated. So however, the analysis um, of, each of them uh, with depend also of the large of the characteristics of the market, uh, the particularities of the agents and the conduct investigate. Um, for example, uh, if you know, uh, Colombia is considering one of the top 
15 um, beer consumption per capita in the world. And recently, in uh, uh, 2022, uh, the SIC opened an investigation against Bavaria, one of the most important uh, uh, agents uh, to produce the beer in, uh, in your country. And um, this investigation against Bavaria allegated for having incurred the conduct uh, provided in the numeral 6 of Article 50 uh, as an abuse of dominant position in the market for production, import, and marketing uh, of beer in Colombia. Um, Bavaria would have apparently used the dom its dominant position in the market uh, uh, in, to block the entry of new competitors through a significant and disproportionately uh, proportionate increase of exclusivity uh, clauses with uh, its uh, distribu uh, distributor. Um, the conduct uh, will have the potential to uh, prevent uh, other parties and new agents uh, from accessing or growing with, uh, within the market. And the conduct presumably resulted in the configuration of uh, an abuse or considered as an abuse of dominance position that will have uh, the purpose of limiting uh, com economic competition in the relevant um, market. However, um, Bavaria requests the early filling to the investigation, uh, offering a commitment to modify its business uh, policy and behavior in the market. Uh, so the dominant company proposed to the competition authority in Colombia uh, to the use, for example, a high percentage of uh, the number of exclusivity clauses uh, with, uh, signed with his, uh, its uh, distributors. Um, they proposed also uh, to implement uh, different measures aimed to improve uh, the competition within the market, uh, such so allowing smaller uh, competitors, for example, to use uh, its distribution chains, for example. Um, for the superintendents of industry and commerce, uh, these commitments um, can be considered uh, successful to, to uh, close or this investigation because uh, this is not a, a sample compliance uh, with regulations and they consider that it's only uh, based on the public uh, or protection promotion of competition. Uh, also, this modification, for example, of the business uh, policy uh, so, uh, through a significant decrease of exclusivity clauses represents for us a structural commitment uh, that seeks to eliminate any possible entry barrier uh, that was being generated in the relevant market. And we also have another case, and um, that is the Imarica case in 2020, when we was uh, we were in the pandemic uh, of COVID. Um, the superintendents also um, opened an investigation against this way in the company Imarica. Um, Imarica is one of the companies uh, that uh, provide medical protection uh, equipment. Um, for having uh, presumably uh, incurring in anti-competitive behavior of excessive pricing. Um, the superintendents closed the investigation, considering that is necessary requirements uh, to sanction an undertaking for imposition of excessive prices has not been met. As I said in my introduction, um, in Colombia, excessive prices will not have to prove uh, the existence of abuse of dominance, but we have uh, like uh, justified uh, the intervention uh, of a, a competition authority. We have uh, um, some considered points or important points to take in, into account. For example, that the investigation undertaking has significant market power. Uh, the presence of high and non-transitory entry barriers and also the absence of a specific regula regulatory agent, like a ministry or something like that. Uh, and also, um, we consider that the competition authority integration um, be carried out exclusively in uh, those situations which uh, is not, this is, uh, this is not uh, correspond or respond to a free uh, interplay, for example, for supply and demand. So, uh, Colombia in this case, considering uh, the economic literature and also the international uh, doctrine, uh, we have set a minimum and necessary criteria to determine 
uh, when a price can be uh, considered excessive. Um, to resume, the first one, uh, we have uh, in the, uh, the first group, uh, we have um, the analysis of relevant market and its structure in order to establish when the investigation, investigative sorry, <clears throat> undertaking has, for example, a high market share uh, to also to analyze the presence of high entry barriers on some different endogenous and exogenous uh, factors that may have an impact on the demand and the supply in the relevant market uh, product or, or service uh, market. So only in these cases, and as uh, some uh, an undertaking has a high market share and a high entry barriers and structural situation persists, the criteria of the second um, group, as we consider, can be analyzed. The second group, so, so quickly I can uh, just explain, consists of establishing where or not the, pre the price uh, is excessive or considering excessive prices. So here in this point, the uh, economic analysis uh, plays a primary role uh, because we have uh, to develop uh, some uh, criteria uh, or fundamental tools uh, to determine the minimum criteria necessary to conclude the excessive prices according to the Colombian um, regulation. So, uh, for example, price cost margins, uh, competitive prices, uh, early prices of the investigative undertaking, and other ones. So we have these two kind of cases, one of the abuse of dominance commitments, and this one uh, for executive pricing uh, that would, I would like to share with us. Thank you very much. I'm turning now to, to Sally. Um, can you tell us more about recent cases that would illustrate this uh, uh, priority given by the current administration to these cases? And what remedies are you looking at in order to eliminate the anti-competitive effects of unilateral conduct? I well, mean, to counter uh, monopolization. Yeah. As I was mentioning before, um, we're definitely focused on seeking criminal prosecution where appropriate, going after individuals, because we think that's much more likely to deter the conduct than just going after the corporations. Um, I pretty much covered the, the stretch of what we have, which is the two Google cases and the recent Zito case. We have the unfortunate requirement that we do have to go to court and we have to sue, we have to uh, prevail in court, and it takes a long time. We don't have interim measures. Um, and we're really not, like I said, very interested in settlements. Um, just we've learned over the years that if you get a sort of commitment from a company, we're not going to do X. Well, they just find Z, Y, A, B, C, D, all to achieve the same ends, different means to achieve, achieve the same ends. And so we're very intent on making sure that we're fixing the problem by litigating cases to their closure if possible um, and getting structural remedies, as well as um, developing the case law. I mean, the dearth of case law on Sherman Act Section 2 is quite unfortunate. Um, so that's also important to this administration. Um, so where does that leave us? We obviously don't like the fact that it takes years <laughs> to fix these problems, um, and it's certainly frustrating. I wanted to talk about a project that I've launched since joining DOJ. I just joined last spring as part of the Biden administration. Um, and a project that I've, I've launched that I'm very excited about is a horizon scanning project. And I know that that's happening also at the UK uh, and, and at the EC. And um, it's real, recognizing the importance of getting out in front of the anti-competitive conduct. Um, not letting the monopolies form for 10 years and then suing them for 10 years, right? You've got 20 years of harm and, and uh, lost opportunity um, for businesses to compete on a level playing field. Um, so what we're doing is really scanning every sector of the economy, making sure we understand where each sector is headed. And you know, you, I hate to say this, but there is opportunity in crisis because of all the multiple crises that the world is facing right now between climate change, um, the recognition that our supply chains are very fragile and that we need to reshore a lot of our manufacturing. Um, there's 
just, and then obviously technological change that's happening, there's just a tremendous amount of transition happening across our economy. And that is an opportunity for new entrants and for dislodging incumbents. Um, and so we want to make sure we understand what are the tools that incumbents are using to protect their turf or to take over the new markets. Um, and honestly, we now really can see very clearly what the monopolist playbook is in the digital economy. It's not different than what the original, you know, robber barons in the U.S., the railroad, the, the, the monopolists that controlled the railroad used exactly the same tactics that are used by the, the biggest monopolies today. It's nothing new under the sun. It's just that our reliance on outdated models that really came about in the 1970s and the 1980s made us miss, uh, you know, the monopolization that was happening. Um, you know, ironically, the Sherman Act from 1890 is not outdated, um, but the kind of thinking that took over antitrust law in the 1980s is outdated and made us miss uh, the, the conduct that is now, um, you know, causing a lot of harm in our economy. Now that we have our eyes open, we understand the monopolist playbook in the digital economy, there's a lot we need to do to stave it off as these transitions happen. And, you know, we're all focused on, you know, say, the app store on our phone. What, what, one thing that I've learned from starting this project is that app stores are proliferating across the entire economy, um, in energy, in uh, agriculture, you know, uh, cars. Um, and we think we live in a digital economy now. We're really only partway there. Everything is being even more digitized. And so the playbooks that we've seen uh, on the internet um, are eating the whole world, basically. There is no offline world anymore. Everything, you know, there's sensors in the seeds, in the, in the farmer's fields, right? So we really need to make sure that we do interventions early as these transitions are happening. Um, and we can do that um, a few different ways. We can do interagency advocacy. That's been a big priority of the Biden administration. Um, there was an, you know, the, if you all know about the executive order on competition that Biden put out, it focused on a whole uh, government approach to antitrust enforcement. So, you know, we have agencies that regulate all these different uh, industries. And so working with them to make sure that the rules that they promulgate are not um, creating entry barriers um, and that some of these playbooks, as I mentioned, can be kind of cut off um, at the past by having rules that promote open competition. Um, so that's something that I'm very excited about. It's been fun. Also scary. <laughs> if you look at the future, um, you know, the, the tactics that we're seeing, uh, the opportunity for, you know, um, gatekeepers and um, tolls and extractive business models and control of data uh, by dominant players to the exclusion of smaller players in every sector of the economy is just going to get um, more and more intense. Um, so that is our, you know, major, one of the major tools that we're using to kind of deal with this delay issue. Um, I think, oops, my timer's gone, so I don't know. One second. Okay, that's about right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, so now I take my turn, and hopefully the uh, um, slides. Okay, so um, 2022 has been a very productive case in terms of unilateral conduct cases in, uh, in Spain. Um, as you see in that picture, uh, we have five abuse of dominance decisions, which actually account for six infringements, because in one of the decisions you have two, two abuses. And uh, then on top of that, uh, we have also another decision of unilateral conduct that is under uh, this Article 3 of a fair competition that I mentioned in my first intervention. Um, so uh, there, there you have it. Uh, all of the cases in 2022 had, were exclusionary abuses. One of them had also a, an element of exploitative abuse for excessive uh, prices. It was a combination of both. Uh, before I turn to the next uh, slide, I want to say that uh, in Spain we, we use normally behavioral remedies, as I mentioned, 
and it is a, it is challenging, of course. Uh, so for 10 years now, we have had a monitoring unit that uh, deals with the monitoring of commitments, remedies, conditions, when it is uh, about mergers, so both in mergers and antitrust uh, cases. It's a dedicated uh, unit for, for that. And that's how we make it possible. Still, it is challenging. Turning to the second uh, slide, um, well, I'm certainly not going to explain to you all the abuse cases, and actually uh, my colleague from the board is going to explain some of them in, the, in plenary five. But I, I need these to illustrate the sort of cases we are having and the measures that we have uh, introduced. So the, the first case concerned is cor called Correos 3, so post 3. Uh, the incumbent uh, national post company established a loyalty rebate system uh, in the traditional postal services uh, with exclusionary effects she, since uh, uh, they encouraged uh, large business companies' loyalty, preventing the entry of competitors. Uh, I bring it up to say that in this case we adopted interim measures. Um, and uh, which were the interim measures? One, the order to refrain from offering uh, commercial discounts that go beyond the maximum limit set at its uh, price scheme for large clients. And then, in order to follow this up and monitor uh, the duty to report on a quarterly basis uh, to the Directorate for Competition of all offers and all contracts uh, signed with large customers pending the final decision. Um, but uh, Correos uh, uh, appealed against these interim measures in 2020 uh, to the review court and uh, the Audiencia Nacional lifted the interim measures applied by the CNC. Uh, so, according to the court, uh, uh, the CNMC had not sufficiently explained why it was strictly necessary to take these measures prior to the final decision. Uh, bear in mind what I have told you about the short period we have to actually have the final decision on the merits. Um, the court said that the authority must submit uh, indicia or incriminating evidence establishing a significant likelihood that an infringement uh, had been committed, and that interim measures could not be used to execute in advance the sanctions that uh, could only be imposed uh, in the final decision. Um, then you have there in another case, the Royal Canine uh, Society of Spain, uh, there the CNMC found uh, an abuse of dominance uh, you have to take into account that this association is the only one that can deliver uh, the export pedigree <laughs> certificate for pure blood. Um, uh, this looks like a Harry Potter tale. The pure blood uh, uh, dogs <laughs> of breeders. <laughs> yeah, it just struck me uh, at the moment. Uh, it hindered the activity of rival associations and discriminated against uh, canine uh, judges uh, by conduct that slowed down the expansion of these associations. I will not dwell in the full, uh, um, you know, just to, to explain this. And then it happened to reduce the revenues of these uh, competing associations. And on top of that, there were some measures uh, preventing the judges of uh, competitions uh, in this field to work with other associations. So um, there was a behavioral remedy, so that's the, the, the point here. So in view of the above, on top of the fines uh, imposed, uh, the CNMC ordered to facilitate access to the expert pedigree uh, certificate for breeders registered uh, in the stat books uh, um, of officially recognized competing nation national associations. Uh, who requested. And uh, then in the, the other cases are in the energy sector and in the pharma sector, that are the ones that my colleague is going to explain later. So uh, the Enel Green, this was in um, Enel Green decision concerns an intermediary 
for all companies, that is the dominant position, an intermediary for all companies that are promoting renewable uh, energy generation who want to have access to the power transmission network. And it abused its dominant position by basically self-preferencing, to cut it short. So in this case, uh, we, we had cease and desist orders. Uh, the CNMC also fined Merck Sharp Dom uh, due to a sham litigation case uh, in pharma concerning the patent uh, protecting the contraceptive uh, Nuvaring, which was the first vaginal ring in, uh, in Spain. Um, I will not dwell in, uh, in the substance, but uh, the CNMC fined, of course, MSD, and on top of that, it ordered it, uh, to refrain in the future from engaging in conduct similar to that typified or sanctioned uh, in this resolution. And then uh, the Lydian case is another pharma case um, where the CNMC fined the company for abusive practices both of exclusionary and exploitative nature. Um, this was a case in which uh, the, the price of the drugs uh, have multiplied by 14 um, on the Spanish market, and I will also leave it to my colleague, but it's a very interesting case, I promise. And uh, the in interesting part for the purposes of this panel is that uh, in addition to the fine, we also imposed behavioral remedies and the behavioral remedies concerned, on the one hand, to change the exclusivity clauses that the company had with uh, the only provided provider of the active ingredient that we needed for, for this uh, um, drug, and uh, then uh, to market the drug, the CDCA, in Spain at the price negotiated with the Minister of Health. Uh, um, so finally, we had uh, the Audax case under Article 3 uh, for distorting competitions through unfair facts. So a number of um, legal entities within the Audax uh, group uh, deceived uh, natural gas and electricity consumers to make them change your distributor. So they pretended to be the usual electricity or gas distributor calling on the phone and then uh, they misled them to change their contract, right? Uh, the reaction from the CNMC was uh, very quick because of course these uh, attacks also very uh, vulnerable consumers and we managed to prove this infringement which is not always easy because normally these are conversations that go on the phone. So it was a, a very challenging case in that way. But we could prove that it was a widespread uh, conduct affecting thousands of consumers and uh, the, um, the consumer associations had been uh, complaining about this. Um, so finally, we have interim measures that are ongoing in another case that, that is uh, under scrutiny, which is ECOEMBES. Um, uh, well, uh, so uh, there, uh, Ecoembes is the sole manager of the integrated management system for plastic packaging waste in Spain. And uh, there was a complaint against, uh, against uh, this company. We followed up with don rates and we initiated proceedings uh, following Article 2 and Article 102, uh, so abuse of dominance. And the prelim preliminary findings in this case were that the auction procedure used uh, lacked transparency uh, and was carried out without sufficient uh, warranties hampering the access of uh, recycling companies. Uh, let's say that the, there was an alarming situation in which always the same companies were getting the, the contracts uh, which was against all odds. And uh, uh, then we have imposed uh, interim measures. Uh, um, um, so uh, they provide for the participation for the time being of a notary, of a public notary in the auctions uh, procedures and the publication by ECOEMBES on the website uh, uh, so that um, we, can, uh, we can have also a limit on what can be awarded to a single recycler. So this is ongoing and uh, the party has not appealed the decision. It is following up on the interim measures. 
So I will uh, end my intervention there uh, to have uh, the final 10 minutes. Um, I have my own questions for the panelists. Uh, if you have uh, a question that you would like to ask, this is the moment, because otherwise I will go on with my questions. No particular question, then I, I take it up myself, and I am going to turn to my left. Um, what do you think, uh, Lorien, from your experience that should be factored in when deciding to go for commitments instead of remedies? Like in your Google case, will, will, did the, these, uh, do you think the, they work properly, uh, the commitments, or uh, how do you enforce them? Uh, how do we enforce them? Um, we, contrary to Spain, we do not have a, a dedicated team for you know, commitment monitoring. Mm -hmm. we, um, we still monitor commitments, and it is challenging for us, too. Uh, we consider, as, just as you said, that um, breaching commitments, injunctions, or interim measures is a very serious um, infringement. And we have had to sanction um, companies for that. Um, talking about uh, the choice between remedies and injunctions and commitments, I think there is no clear answer to that. I mean, it depends really on the case and on the specificities of the case and at, at the given time of each case. And in the Google-related rights, we see that you know those cases are very complex and we have to, to be agile and to see over time what is necessary at a given period of time. And here we, we decided to go for interim measures first, then to sanction really quickly because there was a breach and it was important to, for the authority to, to sanction that breach right away. And then finally, um, um, after negotiating with Google, we came up with a solution that is commitments and that is elaborate and seems to us to be robust and uh, comprehensive and we hope it's the right solution, but we're gonna monitor those commitments very seriously and we'll see. Thank you very much. Um, let's say in our own experience, since we have used uh, both, and uh, well, he here I can also speak uh, a bit from uh, previous experiences, even in other, uh, in other jurisdictions, because uh, before being at the Spanish Competition Authority, I was at the European Commission, and before that I was at the Dutch Competition Authority. Uh, I think that it is important to have a choice, you know, that you are able to deploy all your possibilities, all your instruments, and that uh, you are not afraid to, to do that. Actually, in the last year, in 2022, at the CNMC, we have used all the articles in the law, and we have used all the provisions. And uh, I think that uh, um, there is a matter of, you know, flexibility is important. It is also important to be able to redeploy your, your resources sometimes. Uh, so. Uh, it is true that from the perspective of the company to, to offer commitments means that uh, less time around since you don't have to, uh, to acknowledge uh, that you, your guilt uh, and you don't have a final decision saying that there was an infringement as such, you are not a recidivist uh, next time around and it is more difficult to, to obtain damages so you have this uh, as, a, as an extra for, for the commitments. So what is in it for the authority that is uh, getting the commitments? So first of all, the most important thing for me in, in, in the cases is that sometimes it's the way to restore competition immediately. And uh, so on balance, uh, public interest sometimes uh, wants this to happen because in another decision in which you are imposing fines and maybe imposing the remedies, Normally, the company goes immediately to court, and then they obtain the suspension of uh, of the fines and even of the of the remedies. So, that's the most compelling reason uh, for me: the public interest in in finalizing a, a conduct that uh, that was problematic. And um, then um, I wanted to turn to to all of uh, you for a final word. If there is something that you think you you wanted to emphasize 
Uh, before we, we close it, we have just five minutes and I will say a word on international cooperation in the last minute. So Sally, do you start? Sure, yeah, I wanted to make a point about merger enforcement. I think we often forget how integral that is for preventing unilateral conduct. Um, and certainly as part of that horizon scanning project that I mentioned before, we're also kind of looking at forward to see what are the kinds of mergers that we can expect to come through that might build these monopolies of the future or fortify existing monopoly power. Um, and if you look at our recent, our two Google complaints, both of them include um, several allegations of anti-competitive acquisitions. So our uh, enforcement against unilateral conduct needs to also start with very strong merger enforcement that prevents both the building of the monopolies of the future and um, acquisitions that fortify existing monopoly power or build moats around monopoly power or create entry barriers. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeanette? Yes, as Lauren also said, I think that um, the su successful of uh, fulfillment of commitments and remedies depends, uh, for example, a uh, preventive way, for example, with uh, economic studies uh, that we can do in a sector, a particular sector, and we can identify uh, the particularities of the different sectors. Um, but also uh, to follow up on the fulfillment of commitments and remedies uh, that are implemented. It depends also of uh, monitoring, uh, for example, in Colombia, uh, since uh, 2022, we have the Compliance Directorate uh, with uh, the Superintendent of Industry and Commerce uh, has the function to follow up uh, this uh, framework of administrative uh, investigation. And uh, also to, to correspond to, to the authority to effectively uh, monitor compliance uh, with these measures. So I think it is important, a preventive way and with uh, economic studies and uh, also the characteristic of the sector, but also uh, to the function that we have uh, through, for example, the comp uh, compliance director um, to prevent also uh, this kind of conduct. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Marina, your final words? I mean, your final words for this plenary. <laughs> <laughs> this is no, no threat. <laughs> um, so similar to what Jeanette was mentioning, we also have a um, unit that has to do with preventative uh, measures or monitoring of unilateral behavior. Uh, this economic intelligence unit was set up last year and um, it's basically a market monitoring unit that um, that tries to study different markets and, and carry out market studies and flag down uh, potentially anti-competitive behavior, especially by dominant undertaking. So that's one of the tools that ECA has used to kind of speed up its investigations of unilateral conduct by um, flagging these market players before they can carry out this conduct or before we receive a complaint. But there's also some things that we're hoping to amend in our law to make intervention even faster. So we're hoping to soon um, present amendments to the parliament, uh, giving ECA the power to issue fines or administrative fines. We think that would make uh, intervention stronger and faster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lorian. Maybe a one minute word on monitoring. I, I, I maybe should have said a few minutes ago that uh, we do monitor uh, commitments, for instance, but in recent uh, complex unilateral cases, um, we, uh, the, the authority um, chose that uh, commitments be monitored by an independent trustee. Uh, and this is, uh, I mean, this can be a solution in uh, fast moving markets, um, increasingly uh, technical, uh, cases and when you need expertise uh, to, um, to have this uh, independent trustee monitor uh, the commitments. And in the related rights case, for example, uh, the trustee can be assisted by experts in several fields, IP experts, technical experts, financial experts. So that might be a useful tool. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So just to, to end on, uh, on a point, I think that is within the remit of the ICN. Uh, while increasing convergence, we saw that in uh, yesterday, increasing convergence may be an objective uh, uh, of the ICN uh, regarding the theories of harm. 
in a unilateral conduct when it comes uh, really to the possible parallel enforcement actions in, in juris of different jurisdictions uh, in basically the same uh, case. We would uh, really need international cooperation actions uh, to avoid conflicting demands on firms, uh, to avoid conflicting timing and conflicting remedies. So uh, these are all matters that fall under the remit of the ICN and there is work to do in, in the future. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure for me to moderate uh, this uh, panel of uh, women enforcers. Thanks. Arigato. Thank you, panelists. Thank you very much.